Welcome to Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. Now let's join our host, Tom Shorkey. Welcome to Conversations. I'm your host for today's program, Tom Shorkey. Now what we did for today's unique guest is we spent our we sent our conversation undercover group out to East China. And we asked them, let's find a resident in East China that's got a whole nother life going on that we don't know about locally. And what they have unearthed for conversations today is the retired fire chief of the city of Detroit. And he has many stories to tell and I'm looking forward to talking with him. Our guest today on Conversations is Larry Kamalski, better known to the neighborhood, the golfers, and the fishermen as Kaz. Welcome to Conversations, Larry. Thank you, John. Now, what I always do for our audience at home is I like to do a little background. Okay. And usually we start off with somebody and they in, invariably tell me, well, I grew up in Marine City or St. Clair or whatever, but Obviously not the case with you. No. What little city did you grow up I in? I grew up in the city of Detroit by the Plymouth factory on Mon Elliott in Huber area. Uh, the street I grew up on was called Hedge. And we hung out at a small park called Baraga. We had a little gang yeah. called the Baraga Boys. Yeah. <laughs> and what but, high school did you end up going to in that neighborhood? Well, I went to Resurrection Grade School, and from there I went to St. Lad's high school in Hamtramck, and then to Pershing. Uh, I found out I was not uh, a person that should, that was going to go to college. Yeah. I knew that. And going to Pershing, uh, my grades went from a D, where I was taking Latin and calculus, et cetera, to straight A's because I was taking machine shop and drafting and uh, ROTC, which I enjoyed, and uh, electronics, and working with my hands, and I really enjoyed it. And back in the days, early 60s, we're talking about, uh, Pershing Doughboy, I think, is, was the exactly. nickname. Exactly. I mean, there was the a, yellow and the blue. There was a ton of kids at Pershing and all the city high schools at that time. Yes. Well, the reason you're on our show today, Larry, is, gee, people just thought you were just this retired guy in East China fished a little bit, golfed a little bit, and just one day when you and I were talking and I asked you what you did in your spare time and you said, well, I paint a little bit. And that kind of got us rolling. But realistically, your career was with the Detroit Fire Department. And for our audience at home, your 36-year career, you were a rookie when the riots happened in Detroit in 67. Yes. You were about ready to retire, fire chief status, uh, right after 9-11. So you have really seen the gamut of the city of Detroit and how it's changed, yes, I et have. Tell the audience at home, just a little bit to start with, what goes through the mind of a, of a rookie fireman? What? Well, you're afraid. You're, you're really afraid of your first fire because it's the unexpected. Uh, was the same thing when I made my first jump. It was the yeah. unexpected. You, you don't know. Yeah. And once you get acclimated to it, you know, you respond differently. You act differently. You, you know what's going on. But uh, in our job, it takes the rule of safety first, always. So you don't just rush in. I made a foolish mistake as a rookie when I heard a lady say, my baby's in there. I rush in and I'm going up the stairs, smoke, and I reached under a bed and I grabbed this little baby and it said, Mama, and I ran out and said, I got the baby, I got the baby. And they were all looking at me and I looked down, it was a doll. When you tilted it, it said, Mama. Oh. Well, they nailed it up on the wall, saved by cars. I got calls from all the other firehouses. Nice job, cars, good rescue. Yeah. And he, even got citations mailed to me from the How chiefs and the commissioner, you know, and for saving the, the doll. Mm. But uh, I learned. You learn early. 
and probably learn fast. It was a hard way to learn a lesson, yeah. but a good way. Yeah. Well, it must have paid off because over the years, as as you went up the ranks, but what what did firemen? What kind of shifts did you guys work well, back? Well, we then? work a day and then we're off a day and we work another day. When you say day, a day, though, you mean twenty four hours. hours. We eat together. Uh, we played cards. We did dishes. We fought fires. We slept next to each other and passed air in each other's faces. But uh, yeah. I tried to always say grace before we had dinner or lunch. And uh, it's a brotherhood that nobody can explain unless they've been a part of it. It's a brotherhood that very similar to the Army when I was in the paratroopers that I have always got your six. Mm -hmm. And when a man has your six, you fight with confidence, whether it's fire or people or whatever. You know someone's behind you. Got your you. back. They always got your back. So it, it was a heck of an experience on the job, and I met such wonderful people. And Well, and for our audience, uh, Larry, there's a lot of, now there are probably some 24-hour shifts when you're on the, on the engine at all times, racing here and there, but there's also a lot of downtime. And somewhere along the way, you had picked up a talent for sketching and painting, and you got involved with some artwork with the fire department. How did that begin? Well, it started out with, uh, I used to bring my easel in, and on my downtime, other guys like to play cards, and I did too. I played euchre with them mm -hmm. or gin, uh, usually gin. But uh, sometimes uh, everybody needs their alone time. Mm -hmm. And I spent mine painting. And one of the chiefs from community relations saw it and says, guys, would you mind doing a coloring book for us? I said, I'd be glad to. So I drew up a coloring book for him. And finally, he says, uh, how'd you like to do a mural for the fire department? I said, sure, I'd love to. Uh, I don't have the money for it. I've had children mm -hmm. on the job. And uh, so he got me a grant from Michigan Council of the Arts, and I did one mural depicting the, hit, the uh, burning of Fort Detroit in 1805. And from there, it just took on its own life. I did another one, uh, Belle Isle Bridge Fire in 1915, and right up to the modern day fire department. And. Uh, it so how, and those too. murals, what, what, what's the size of a typical mural? Oh, probably four and a half feet by six feet. Uh, they were pretty big. And you've got eight of them now that hang in the headquarters of the fire department? Well, Is I that where they hope are? so. Yeah. Well, I know you've been retired for a couple of years. No, but. exactly. I think somebody should investigate because I think some of them had disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they were meant for the city of Detroit. And I hope they held on to them, but uh, that's for somebody else. I mean, once I do a painting, I got to forget about it. What was the painting with the uh, and uh, our uh, inveterate uh, producer is folding these into our conversation? But was it some Midwest something fire where you had the Dalmatian on oh, the fire? Oh, Midwest truck? Paper Company fire. Yeah, every company in the city of Detroit went there. Because it burned for three days twice. <laughs> <laughs> so every company was there. My dog wasn't actually there. His name was Prince. Yeah. Uh, he used to ride the rig, though, with me at Engine 50. And on uh, Houston with him and crash it. And it was, it was a pleasure having him there because all the kids, look at the dog, mommy, look at the fire dog. Yeah. You know? So that was exciting. But... Uh, I used him in a painting I did on a wall inch in 50, which is now gone. Yeah. There's probably a lot fewer of those engine companies now than there were back in the day. I'm well, a lot less. You know, when, when I re came on the job, we had uh, six, sometimes seven men on a rig. And it was nice because we rolled the back of the rig. Mm -hmm. You're putting on your fire coat, holding on to a bar. We never fell. Yeah. 
And uh, they were good old days, but naturally Yosha came along, and I got to say it's a good thing. Because by the time I made captain, it was before this rig even goes out the doors, you will be seated and you will be buckled. Yeah. So things changed considerably, and we went from having six men, seven men, to three men. Uh, and the technology, I'm sure, changed considerably on those. Oh, it has. I, I had 1,236 men on when I retired, and they're down to around 800 now. I retired in 2003, and they've closed a lot of firehouses. And, uh, geographically, uh, I can understand Detroit's lost a tremendous amount of population. However, uh, they still need the protection, and I have decisions should demand it. Well, you and I have had an opportunity to talk uh, many fire stories, but I think the one that we'd like to reference today is, and I think it was in the early 80s, I can't pin the date down, but uh, when the Buell building in downtown Detroit caught on fire, and that was an, there, there's a headline uh, and a story about it that 32 people were rescued that day by by the Detroit Fire Department. You are an integral member of that rescue group, but tell our listeners from your perspective, okay. well, what do you remember about that Buell building fire? When we pulled up, the police were block, blocking. We couldn't get next to the curb because all the cop cars were there. Yeah. And there were people on the seventh floor, and I could see flames and smoke coming out of the window, and, and they were hanging out, and I knew we had to rescue them. Well, our, if we could have got by the curb, we would have reached them. But as it was, uh, we had to be away from the curb, and so our, our, we put the ladder as far as we could, and it did it hit the, below them. So I ran back and grabbed a roof ladder, which has hooks on the end, mm -hmm. and started running up the ladder. Well. Uh, my captain, uh, Frank Liss, was behind me, and he was pushing the back end, and then he petered out because it was a long way up. Yeah. And it's not a job for old men. Yeah. And then uh, finally, uh, Joe Seeger, another good firefighter, uh, I felt him grab it after I went up about five steps. And it felt lighter, and I knew yeah. he was behind me. And then I put my back against the wall, and I was putting it up, and I was hitting something. So I asked Joe. I couldn't see because my helmet was against the back of the building. Mm -hmm. I said, Joe, what am I hitting? He said, there's a parapet sticking out about eight inches, cause. I says, well, <clears throat> on the count of three, I'm going to push out, and you push up. Now, understand, my coat was ballooned out like a skirt. My helmet was floating above my head. Thank God I had my chin strap on. The wind was shearing right up the side. And my knees were going like this, because <laughs> I knew if I fell, that was it. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had to save lives. I mean, that's my job. So I pushed out, he pushed up, and I could feel them grab the hooks, turn it around, and he started coming down right now. And uh, we pulled eight people out of there. It was uh, it was a wonderful feeling, you know, and uh, it's it's not a hero syndrome. It's it's gratification. People say, you're "Oh, doing. you're a hero," but I get more satisfaction out of it, believe me, than other people do. Was I that do. the f was that the fire when um, after you did all that? that like the exhaustion all of a sudden hit you and you went down on your knees? Was oh, that that yeah, because after we rescued them, I went inside and I was still the first man on the pipe. Mm -hmm. And as I went up to the And on floor, the pipe, for our listeners at home, means is you the, were the, main, the front man on the hose. Right. Okay. And you never give up the pipe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I was the first man up there with a the pipe. And uh, we had hooked up to a standpipe. And I, it was total fire. I was just putting out fire, putting out fire, putting out fire. And I, I couldn't see which office was what. Or, and I, it went in a, in a circle, in a half circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I, I got to a, a, another office and was putting that one out. And one of the guys came behind me and said, Kaz, give me your pipe. 
and usually you don't give it up, but it was well, I knew who the guy was. Yeah. And at that point, I was totally Hold wet. It. So I gave it to him. And he says, go outside, sit down. There's a water fountain outside. So I went, took a drink of water fountain, and I sat down. I sat in about that much water. And uh, a buddy of mine, Bob Zygmuntovich, uh, looked at me and says, Kaz, you don't look too good. Uh, I said, well, i, I got to get a little fresh air, Bob. So I went to get up and fell down, and him and another man picked me up, and I remember my feet moving, but I don't know if I was touching the ground. I think they carried me down the stairs. And when I got down, the department doctor was downstairs, and he says, uh, you're going to the hospital. I said, oh, he needs a little fresh air and the water, you know, and I'll, I'll be all right. You're going to the hospital. And it was a funny thing, because I've, I've never had that experience. When I got to the hospital, uh, they closed the curtain around, and I started crying. Now, you're a man. Men don't cry, right? I couldn't stop crying. <clears throat> but it was, the doctor says, that, that's the adrenaline in you. It's got to come out. You had so much given at one time. Your emotions are just all, and it's coming up. You'll be all right. Well, after about an hour, I finally quit crying. It felt like a, doing a high dive in a thimble because uh, my eyes were all red when the nurses came in. But, uh, they gave me some oxygen and water, and I stayed there overnight, and I was fine. Uh, so if anybody Googles the Buell Building fire from, I don't know, 82 or 84, whatever it is, I even think they may see, still in the archives, of... Larry Kosmowski on the stretcher after all the heroics yeah. of getting the people out. But but I think the bottom line is, you said it, well, 32 uh, people were rescued out of that building by Detroit Fire yes, Department that day. Yes, they were. I'm proud of my guys. Yeah. I'm very proud of them. Now, Kaz, you do a lot. We're talking about your murals. We're t uh, you did cartoons. You did coloring books for kids about the fire department. You've written a number of poems. And if we had more time, I'd read a couple of my favorites. But... Uh, you're, and you're in the process of writing a book at this time. So, I mean, really that little East China retired resident is really a Renaissance man with a, with a lot of background. But one of the other things that you did got involved with the clowns. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the whole clown thing. And we're going to run a couple pictures of you and your, All right. your ensemble. I, uh, I joined the clown team. Uh, a guy by the name of Larry Scarface was the uh, president, and he asked me to join. And, and at first, I was just a prop man. I made the props for them, and I went and did running around, bought their makeup for them or whatever they needed. And, uh, and finally, he allowed me, after a year of being the prop man, to put on a face. And I, I didn't like the face I had. It was, Funny, so I went home and I did my own face. I drew it, and then doing overlays, I tried 10, 12 different faces till I found one that I liked, and it was a bum face, yeah. you know. And uh, I had shoes that were real long, and as I walked, they would go flip flop. So I called myself Flip Flop the Clown. Had a little uh, cane with a horn on it, beep beep. <laughs> And I really enjoyed being a clown. I, I did it for 12 years. I loved it because we went to parades. We went to Cobo Hall. We did a lot of things uh, for Christmas for them. Uh, the blue and gold for all the Cub Scouts. And, and especially going to the hospitals at Easter and at Christmas and seeing the kids and getting gifts for them. Most of them I had donated, but some we bought. And... Uh, I'd have fundraisers to raise money so we could buy toys for these kids. Now, who's Jimmy? Who's Jimmy with the clown? Oh, Jimmy is 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 going to be a, it's a tough. I'll tell you the story, of Jimmy. He's a kid. I went to the hospital one time, and uh, I walked in this room, and I was pulling a wagon, and <clears throat> all the gifts were gone out of the wagon. I gave them all away, and they came in the way. He said, that wagon for me? Well, I used it to haul the gifts, but 
I had nothing left. So I said, yeah, that's your wagon. Really? I said, yeah, you want to ride? And he said, yeah. So I said, what's your name? Jimmy, what's your name? I said, I'm Flip Flop. So I'm pulling him down the hall, and of course the nurse is with us, bringing his uh, IV. Mm -hmm. He had leukemia. Well, I fell in love with this little Jimmy, because we'd go in every room, and that's my clown, Flip Flop. That's my clown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would go visit him, try to visit him at least once or twice a week, and, and bring him something, even if it was fruit, and just talk with him for a little while. His mother was there a couple times. And uh, about a year later, I got a phone call from his mother, from the fireman's fund, actually. They said his mother had called, and they want Jimmy was released from the hospital. It's his birthday. Would Flip Flop come out? So I says, I'd be glad to. I went to his home, which was in Detroit, and I put on a magic show for him and all of his friends and brought prizes for him. Uh, just had a good time with the kids. And then uh, I got a call from his mom again that he was in a hospital. And I went to visit him and uh, it tore me up to see him that way. But uh, six months later, I got a call from his mother that Jimmy had passed. Would I come to the funeral? So I put on my face. And I went to the funeral with Flip Flop because he never knew me as anything else. And his mother never saw me, wouldn't know who I was if yeah. I walked in. So I went as a clown and brought him some flowers and a rosary and a thing of Father Solanus Casey. And I went home and took off my face for the last time. Wow. Because I story. was his clown. That's a great story, Larry. Great uh, story. He was. Well, while we're talking hospital, let's segue a little bit. Tell our tell the audience about burn camp. I think that's something that people have no idea what burn camp's all about. The burn camp is a wonderful organization put on by members of the Detroit Fire Department. Now we have a baseball tournament to raise money for them. Uh, Firemen from all over the United States come to it, and we try to raise money for the fire department burn camp because we have found out when a child is burnt and he's in a hospital, he thinks he's just the ugliest thing in the world when he's all mm -hmm. scarred. But if we bring him to a burn camp and he sees other kids that are burnt like him or worse than him, his whole perspective on life changes. And we take him out canoeing and we do crafts with them and and we have wonderful firefighter volunteers that come out Verdeen Day, I know was, was really instrumental in that and uh, Tiny and a couple of the other people that they give so much just giving back. It's a part of what we do, we give back. It's wonderful to see these kids and Matter of fact, I'm doing a painting over here that I want to, uh, I'm going to have somebody, uh, there's some corporation that's going to sponsor having lithographs made to sell, to raise money for the fire department burn camp. Great. And I'll have a thousand, it'll be a limited edition of a thousand, and uh, I'll let the fireman's fund decide how they want to do it, uh, and they can give the money to the burn camp. And uh, I do anything for those burn kids. It, it's something totally different when you carry a, a burnt child out of a fire. It just tears your heart up. Well, with your hospitals, your burn camp, let, let's segue into something a little peppier. Okay. While you sit around those fire halls and guys have to eat, you got involved being a chef. Yes. Often, I don't know if it was a volunteer or you were the low man on the totem pole, but then you ended up entering some cooking contests. How'd that work out for you? Uh, it worked out great. I mean, it's, uh, I entered five different, well, Betty Crocker used to put it on, and I, there's a lot of different companies that have cooking contests. And uh, 
I would ask the person who was in charge of, uh, we had one person that bought all of our staples, uh, the salt, the flour, the potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, and I say, I'm going to enter this contest. If I win, I'll give you the prize, but you're going to pay for my food. And he says, only if you win, which is fine. I'm, I knew that uh, food is a lot like art. It's got to look good first. You eat with your eyes first and then with your mouth. Mm -hmm. If it looks good, you know, so I would make uh, rice molds with pineapple and flowers on the side, the yellow on top, and the string of orange, and then white, and, uh, and sweet and sour sauce to go with it on a platter, and it would just look like you want it. Some of the bosses said, I don't even want to eat it, it's too pretty, I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> well, one of them I entered, the last one, uh, some firefighters all over the uh, metropolitan area, and uh, the prize was a microwave, and after the microwave said, come out where they were big, mm -hmm. you know, instead of these tiny little things. And so he said he'd pay for it, and so I asked my friend, Dick Shinsky, if he would join me, and it was at a cooking college, I think in Livonia or Southfield, I'm not sure, I don't remember. But uh, I don't know what I'm going to make until I go shopping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that day, uh, I bought a bunch of chicken legs. I got a budget I got to work with. So I peeled down a chicken from the bones until uh, I had about that much left and broke it off, pulled the chicken back up, and I stuffed it with a seafood stuffing. And then they made a fire hydrant salad out of uh, red peppers and mm -hmm. and the rice on the inside was wild rice and flavored with pineapple and had a nice little sauce I put over a vignette, and uh, I made uh, chicken leg flambé. I flambéed it as we presented it, and it looked great and it tasted great. And, uh, did well, you want the microwave? I was going to say, did you walk home with a microwave that yeah, day? Yeah, I did. But the funny part was, a week later, it was in the firehouse. A week later, the microwave was stolen. Oh, <laughs> so, but well, uh, I just enjoyed yeah. it because I met a lot of fire, uh, firemen cooks from all over, and we all enjoy cooking. Yeah. You know, it's the pinnacle of our day at the firehouse. Mm -hmm. And there were days where you didn't eat and you didn't sleep. Mm -hmm. We went from fire to fire to fire to fire. And they're doing that more so today than ever. And uh, my heart breaks for these guys today because they they're doing so much more with so much less. And uh, so you look forward to eating. It is well, the greatest part of our And day. you know, a real um, significant uh, part of your career was right at the end when 9-11 occurred. And um, 2001, and then the following Memorial Day, 2002, there was a special ceremony at Madison Square Garden in New York. And uh, you and your wife uh, had the opportunity to attend yeah. Give us your reflections on that day at Madison Square Garden. Well, let me just go back a little bit. When I was deputy chief, I was at Cobo Hall, and uh, with a bunch of other people, we had the ATF sitting next to me. It was uh, Higginbotham from the FBI and Michigan State Police and other fire chiefs. And, uh, we were taking, uh, it was a school on terrorism. And uh, halfway through the class, my buddy Higginbottom says, Cos, look at this. And I saw the plane. I said, that a part of this class? He said, no, that's happening right now. I said, oh, shut the class down. We went across the street to my office. And we're all getting around the TV, and we saw the second plane come in. And I took these books and gave it back to instructors. And I said, pal, it's a whole new world. Go back and rewrite these books. And after I retired, as a matter of fact, they did rewrite them. And uh, I taught quite a few of the classes of terrorism afterwards. About three years after I retired, I was teaching. But uh, I'll never forget when we went 
to New York. I could have been with my own guys. These guys treated us like gold. And uh, I knew quite a few of the guys. We played ball with them up here mm -hmm. and uh, to raise money for the burn camp. Mm -hmm. Could never beat New York. Yeah. Uh, they're tough. But then again, we got the draw from Detroit. Yeah. They draw from uh, Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, Long Island, all the boroughs. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a snowball mm -hmm. chance to hell beat them, but they're great guys. And I learned because when I was young, I rode the rig with New York firefighters. And they don't have single family dwellings like we do in Detroit. They got a few. Mm -hmm. But it's mostly apartment buildings. So I, I ran with them in the Bronx, and we had to walk the fire escape and use the hook and bring up the line, run up, do another one. And you're running up and down. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot like that view building fire. Mm -hmm. Totally exhaust yourself. And they have the same problem we do. Uh, I remember the rig I was riding on. I was a young kid, you got to understand. Uh, they pulled the lever, and it was a wooden ladder that came up on spring. Then you had this big wheel you had to crank to raise it up, and another wheel on the other side to extend it out. And that's a wooden ladder. And I thought we had poor equipment until I went to New York. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated what we had. Those guys, again, they do a lot with a lot less. And uh, to me, they are real heroes. New York firefighters, Chicago firefighters. You know, I can go anywhere in the United States and be welcome as a brother. They will offer me food. They'll offer me shelter, whatever I want. When I was uh, down in uh, Texas at the Alamo, uh, Going on through the river, walk the guys and say, hey, why don't you park by the firehouse over here, you know? Because they saw my fireman sticker. Said, sure. So free parking, mm -hmm. and it was nice. And just had to walk across the street. And they offered us a place if we wanted to spend, but I already had a hotel. Mm -hmm. And they offered us food and told us where to go, where to go eat, what to see. And and they do that in every, in St. Louis, they did it to me. And well, but back on to Madison Square Garden that day, though, how many New York firefighters oh, lost their lives? 343 firefighters had died. And the family, each one of them, brought up in limousines. And uh, only New York firefighters were allowed inside. But one of the captains who had known me was and a firefighter that I was there with. Uh, and a couple of the firehouses, uh, the Nut House and 33s. And they got me tickets for my wife and I to go inside. And when we went inside, uh, the mayor was down there on the stage, and he and uh, Mrs. Clinton were reading out the names of the firefighters, and they would bring down a picture hmm. of the firefighter. And as they brought the picture down, a firefighter would walk in with an American flag. And if you've ever been in Madison Square Garden, it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. And they went all the way around with the 343 firefighters that died. Now, you know, you go to a concert, and a good applause is a good applause is about a minute and a half. Exceptional applause is maybe three minutes. For 15 minutes, we were standing and clapping and crying. And you couldn't stop crying wow. when you thought of all those men that died doing their job and giving their life for their fellow man. Wow. You know, it must have been an impressive day. It was. It was those Larry, guys who, who's been influential with you in your life? I mean, from the time you were a kid down there in the streets of Detroit to 
through your career? Uh, who's been influential? Well, there were a couple of firefighters that were influential to me. Uh, that are, uh, one of them is still alive, Joe Pantano. Uh, uh, and a couple other guys that uh, they passed. And, that really sat me down and talked to me and uh, about the concept of think before you do any actions and how to take the right steps and try to be 10 steps ahead of yourself when you're fighting a fire. <clears throat> you can control everything, but you can't control fate. You don't know when there's a fire below you, you're walking on the board and all of a sudden I have went through a floor and I landed on my tank in the basement and fractured my back. But uh, I had a pipe with me as I went down and uh, they said, we're going to pull you up. I turned, charged the pipe. And so I at least got put mm -hmm. some of the fire out as they were pulling me up. Mm -hmm. But they did pull me up. They had my six. And so you don't know See, when I became a boss, a sergeant, I would tell the guys, listen, leave your prejudice at the door before you walk in. Because when a hand reaches in to pull you out, and I did fall through a roof, landed in a bedroom where every wall was on fire, you're not going to look to see if that hand is black, white, yellow, male, female, fat or skinny, you're going to grab it. And remember that. Keep it in your head. We're all brothers and sisters on this job. We're there for each other. Always have their sex. And that's where the love comes in. The friendship that stays with you forever. I can say, and the pride oozes out. If you had words of wisdom, young people now say they want to go into public service, law enforcement, fire department, border patrol. What, what, what would you do? I tell young people interested in that kind well, of career. <clears throat> I tell them the same thing. I told my own children. I says, I was fortunate. See, when I was a little kid, the other kids were playing the army. I was playing fireman, mm -hmm. running around with a fire helmet, a plastic fire helmet, and my siren, and I had a little light on top. Uh, I lived my dream, and. If you do something you enjoy, you never have to work a day in your life. And I thoroughly enjoyed my job. Although I got injured, people died, there was good and bad in it. Uh, I tell them to stay in school. Same thing I told my kids. I said, hey, think of this. I'm running into a burning building and the rats and roaches are running out. Now, who's, where's the intelligence factor <laughs> here? You know? And it's the truth. Uh, stay in school, kids. Get, get the best education. Be the most that you can be. I always try to, I did what I wanted to do because I had chosen that. But it's not a profession that you want to go into lightly. Give it thought before you jump into being a policeman or a firefighter. Because it takes a special person to put themselves in harm's way on a daily basis and you've got to be able to get along with all these people, sleep next to them when they're passing air in your face and, and uh, cussing at you and, and giving you advice that you really don't want to hear. And uh, we call them the crap house lawyers. But stay in school. Get the education. Be the most that you can be. You know, that's an old Great. army thing, but Great. it's true for every kid. Larry, how'd you end up in East China, Michigan, of all places? Well, I was a city boy my whole life. And uh, I never knew what it was like to live out in the city. And I told my wife I'd like to move out on the water and uh, uh, get a little condo when I retire and just some place, maybe a garage in the back where I could do some painting and writing. And, Whatever crafts I get into, I like carving. And, uh, but uh, my wife found this place where we live now, and it's uh, in Diamond Cove, 
itself. And I said, honey, that's not a little, that's a house. She said, but it's a condo association. Mm -hmm. I adore my wife. I had the most wonderful lady in the world. And I said, fine, if this is what you want, we'll get it. I am not cutting the grass. Because mm -hmm. the guys asked me, Cos, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, I'm going to fish, I'm going to paint, I'm going to golf, and I'm going to make love to my wife, and I'm going to do a lot of the first three. <laughs> so that's what I want to do, fish, paint, and golf. And now I'm writing, too, and uh, i like to get back into glass blooming. I have a friend in Ohio who invited me down. I may be doing that again, but... Uh, Sounds like you have a full retirement. Well, I enjoy it out here because I can see the horses and the cows and the goats. and I've never had that opportunity being a city kid, mm -hmm. you know, seeing the farms and to me, the beauty of seeing a, a newly turned, the dirt all turned over and turned under, I mean, they don't, now they bury the stuff that they grew for, and use it as fertilizer. But to see a newly plowed field just gives me joy. I love seeing Well, I think that. you've given joy to a lot of people. For our audience at home, I hope you've had some great insight into East China resident Larry Kamalski, known to every one of his friends as Kaz. Kaz has had an illustrious career with the fire department. He has a multitude of talents, very artistic, and a genuine human being. It's been our pleasure on Conversations to have Larry as our guest today. Thank you for watching. You've been watching Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. If you have an idea for a future conversation, please contact us at www.watchctv.org. Thanks for watching Conversations with Tom Shorkey.